Hello, this is Adam Wolf, physical therapist. Wanted to take a minute and talk about the importance of the triplane load ability of the midfoot, particularly when the foot hits the ground. And so how important that midfoot ability is to go through dissociated movement is to loading the system. We need to understand that the body is three-dimensional and triplanar, and that when my foot hits the ground, my in gait, my calcaneus is the first bone to hit. And because the calcaneus is the first bone to hit, particularly outside of the bone, because of where the rest of the weight is through the system, what that means when your left foot hits the ground is that your left calcaneus everts. The left foot, what it means is the left foot, rear foot goes faster. It goes faster than the bones below it, which in this case is the forefoot. And it goes also faster than the bones above it, which in this case, if we're thinking about the calcaneus, the calcaneus motion is directly linked to the talus. So that calcaneus and talus mobility is directly linked to what happens above. And so that left foot hitting the ground into the system is a bottom up motion into the extremities, the knee and up into the hip. But it's a top-down motion into the forefoot. And so if we think about triplane load of that first zone for the midfoot, when my left foot hits the ground, you can imagine it's hitting in this position. It goes through plantar flexion, right? So my left foot, rear foot goes through plantar flexion. When my left rear foot goes through plantar flexion, what that means is my forefoot relative to that is going through a dorsiflexion. So the sagittal plane motion at the first zone when your foot hits the ground should be dorsiflexion. The frontal plane motion when your left foot hits the ground, because as we said, your, the weight is unevenly distributed, it's more towards midline. When your left foot heel hits the ground on the outside, it's immediately gonna evert, it's gonna roll out. Now that forefoot rolling out, that, excuse me, that rear foot moving out makes the forefoot roll out. So the whole, fore, the whole foot is everting when your left foot hits the ground. But remember that the heel or rear foot strikes first. Because the heel strikes first, both the forefoot and rear foot are both everting, but the forefoot does it slower than the rear foot, or another way to say it is the rear foot does it faster than the forefoot. So they're both going through this motion. The, front of the, the back of the foot does it faster than the front of the foot. And if we think about, remember that motion is named for what the distal bone does on a fixed proximal bone. In this case, both the front of the foot or back of the foot are both bones are everting, they're both going in the same direction, but the back bone, or excuse me, the, the rear foot, the, the proximal bone does it faster than the forefoot or distal bone. And so relative to the rear foot eversion that occurs, the forefoot goes through inversion. That frontal plane motion of inversion is important. So we've got sagittal plane dorsiflexion, we've got frontal plane inversion. When my left foot hits the ground, Remember that weight distribution and where it is, because my calcaneus everts, my talus, which sits atop of it, dives down and in. So I'll do this from above. The left foot hits out, the talus dives down and in. And so it's moving towards midline. And it's moving towards midline faster than what is the above bone is doing. So the proximal and the, the proximal bone of the tibia follows along with the distal bone of the talus down and in. And so that equals because the distal bone is moving faster than the proximal bone, it equals rear foot adduction. It's moving towards midline. You can almost see that, uh, that talus drop down and in and move to midline and make the tibia follow along an internal rotation and create the motion up the, up the chain. But if the rear foot and forefoot can't do that at different speeds, right? So that left foot, that rear foot drops down into middle what that means is that the forefoot is relatively abducting to that. The forefoot is not abducting or moving out. It's a rear foot moving in faster than the forefoot moves in to cause a relative forefoot abduction. And in my opinion, the forefoot abduction is really the critical motion that's needed to turn on the transverse plane up into the glutes. And so if we think of from motor control theories and fascial connections of the body, Perry Nicholson would say the posterior sling, well, and he talks about the big toe connection. And I 100% agree, but I also think that that midfoot connection and ability to load, particularly at that zone, is what's gonna allow that, that glute complex to turn on or that posterior X sling uh, through anatomy trains would turn on. And so, 
I assess that midfoot and, uh, ability, and I, I've, I've tied that midfoot's inability. If, if that motion can't be gotten there, that motion can't be gotten, then the system, those joints in through here, particularly typically in the lateral column, are going to be compressed. And that can inhibit the system if we're thinking about facilitation and inhibitions. Uh, particularly from that motor control theory. And so I've been able to tie on numerous occasions at this point that weak glute to that can't fire appropriately or is inhibited to an inability of that midfoot to go through that motion. If we can decompress that midfoot, both columns, but particularly that lateral column, and get those cuneiforms to drop down and in a little bit, then we're gonna be able to lengthen that entire proprioceptive system to turn on the glute. And so just the other day, we had a study group and we were playing and talking about some of this, which is the inspiration for this video. And we were able to decompress and mobilize those cuneiforms, which if we think about, they're unable to go through that dorsiflexion, inversion and abduction. What that means, particularly the cuneiforms, is that they're plantar flexed, inverted, and adducted. So we need to take them through the opposite motion and what we can do is just wind up the cuneiforms, kind of evert them and dorsiflex them, kind of add a, a, a glide this way, okay, a caudal glide I guess that would be, and then we could just assess joint motion. You'll see that that will be limited along with that motion. So if we can get more motion here, we can get the glutes to turn back on. We've seen it without them even getting off weight bearing or up on a weight bearing. We can immobilize that midfoot we can get the glute to be stronger and fire really quickly and have that neural lock. It has it or it doesn't when you test a muscle. It's gonna have a neural lock, it's not. And before it didn't, afterward it did. Their integrated homework was a rotational squat, I call it. I think about you have a flashlight in your belly button and we're gonna do a squat. I wanna make sure I get that hip to move out past the knee. I wanna make sure that that left big toe is really driving into the ground there because that's gonna get that drive into the ground of the big toe is gonna make the talus drop down and in a little bit faster and farther and which is gonna create that mobility in the midfoot, that forefoot abduction, but also turn on the internal rotation, get a little bit more to turn on those glutes. And so their homework might be that rotational squat emphasizing that big uh, that bug underneath, that big toe, driving that big toe into the ground. Their flashlight in their belly button is gonna shine outside of their trail leg, or in my case, my right leg right here, because that's gonna help to lengthen that pretty authentically in my opinion. So just wanted to show that to you. Try it when you're in your clinics or whatnot to dorsiflex, invert, take up those two planes of motion. See how much uh, abduction of the forefoot you can get, accessory motion of the forefoot you can get. Maybe we can create some discussion, thanks.